Jim Malio and Susan Borges of Florida were killed during a vacation to Mexico in November of 2012 when their rented dune buggy smashed into a guardrail. They were out on shore leave from a four-day cruise with Royal Caribbean with the ship docked at Cozumel when the pair disembarked along with around two dozen of their friends. The group of pals then decided to rent some dune buggies. Some in the group reportedly had reservations about the safety features of the dune buggies, including things like missing seat belts, but they decided to go for it. Jim and Susan were on board a four-seater with two of their buddies, Wagner and Liz Ferreira. This was apparently a backup buggy, the first that the four had been driving having broken down earlier in the day. Wagner was behind the wheel but suddenly lost control of the vehicle. The rogue sand slider came to a final halt against a guardrail. The crash flung Jim from the vehicle while Susan was trapped in the back seat. Nearby friends from their group watched it all happen. Reports said that the buggy was driving along smoothly then suddenly veered toward a nearby guardrail before finally colliding at high speed. The friends who were nearby, along with two critical care nurses that happened to be around, attempted to save the gravely injured couple, but their efforts were not enough. The two were dead on the scene. Stateside news of the incident spread quickly to Jim and Susan's vast friend group, who arranged a service not long after. According to these friends, the two souls that were lost were known to be kind and generous and to have a zest for life that was not commonly seen in ordinary people. Mexican authorities, meanwhile, looked into the accident and ultimately decided that no fault could be found. News reports south of the border said that Wagner and Liz had been booked in connection to the accident, but this proved untrue when they returned to the States in short order. Number 25. Stacy and Jesse Ropos Winnipeg couple Stacy and Jesse Ropos left for a long-delayed honeymoon in Mexico with no idea that Stacy would be coming home without her husband of eight years. On January the 13th, 2023, Jesse was killed in a fight in the bar of the hotel that the couple was staying at. The tragedy took place mere hours before the two were set to conclude their first major trip together and head back to Canada. The two went to the bar together to cap off the night and their vacation. When Stacy decided she'd had enough and retired to their room, Jesse decided to stay. At some point after she left, Jesse reportedly got into a fight in the bar. He was ejected, but met with a local friend and calmed down. He was allowed back into the bar at this point. But once he was inside, the fighting started up again. When he was removed, this time, hotel security was said to be holding him down. A man who was later identified as the bar supervisor joined the fray outside, putting Jesse into a chokehold. From what Stacy was told, the choke was meant to be a sleeper chokehold, but something went wrong. Stacy was awoken by hotel staff after the incident and brought out from her room, staff took her to the scene and explained what had happened. She ran to her unresponsive husband, beyond tape put up by police officers who had responded to the violence. Jesse was pronounced dead on the scene. Stacy told CBC News about the harrowing ordeal. She highlighted that the hardest part was having to break the news to the peers three children. To add insult to injury, the cost of transporting Jesse's body back to Canada went beyond what the Ropos' travel insurance would cover, forcing Stacy to ask for help and open her own wallet to get her husband's body back to his homeland and begin preparations for the funeral service. The two hotel employees, said to be directly involved, were arrested. A preliminary hearing was held in Mexico which Stacy attended remotely. To date, Quintana Roo's state officials, including the Attorney General's office, have been tight-lipped with any further details about the case. Number 24. El Paso Couple Bagged up On January 16th, 2023, a couple from El Paso, Texas, were found tied up, gruesomely dismembered in bags along the side of the road. Ulisa Ramirez and Nohemi Medina Martinez met their end in the Mexican city of Cuidad Juarez, where they were visiting relatives. 
They were survived by three children whose fates, as of this writing, are unclear. El Paso, where Ramirez and Martinez reportedly lived together, is directly across the Rio Grande from Cuidad Juarez. The two had been married in 2021. The pair were last seen by relatives the day before the discovery on a Saturday. Their bodies were found along the Juarez El Borbinia Highway on Sunday, and two more victims were discovered that Monday in eerily similar shape. Through unspecified means of investigation, local authorities in the state of Chihuahua named two suspects, 24-year-old David R. and 25-year-old Jacqueline Isella. The investigation led by the state's specialized homicide unit of women for gender reasons has thus far culminated in a search of the residence on Del Ejido Street, where the crime allegedly took place. The two suspects have been charged with aggravated femicide, with the latest updates in the case indicating that the pair are awaiting trial. Cuidad Juarez is a border town notorious for violence against women and against the LGBT community. The two victims were part of a streak of nine murders of women in that January, amounting roughly to one woman killed every 45 hours. The deaths of Ramirez and Martinez took place just days before a planned meeting of a speciality council that the local government had put together to deal with this long-standing issue. Number 23. Shanquela Robinson Shanquela Robinson, a 25-year-old North Carolina native, was brutally beaten to death in a Cabo San Lucas hotel room with friends on October 29th of 2022, while others watched and even recorded. The now viral video of the event shows Shanquela without any clothing, being savaged by another woman. The five friends she brought with her did nothing to stop the fight and even egged the violence on. The attacker at some point in the fight managed to break Shanquela's spine. According to a later autopsy report, this grievous injury is what ultimately spelled the end for the young hairstylist. According to a North Carolina news outlet, the five friends that were with her were Khalil Cook, Malik Dyer, Wenta Donovan, Elise Hyatt, Dehaney Jackson, and Nazir Wiggins. Cook called Salamandra Robinson, the victim's mother, to say that she was under the weather and apparently suffering from alcohol poisoning. A panicked call later on informed the victim's parents that there were multiple ambulances on site and efforts to resuscitate Shanquela were underway but not going well. Medic's best efforts were not enough and Robinson was pronounced dead at the scene. In the aftermath, Cook brought home his deceased friend's luggage to give to her family and told them she had died of alcohol poisoning. He showed up regularly and even brought his mother around as he continued to maintain his innocence in the killing and surrounding events. The victim's family trusted Cook and took his word at face value until they received autopsy photos showing the victim in a severely battered state. US and Mexican officials investigated the case and initially stated that they failed to find any signs of foul play. As such, the death was being treated as an accident rather than a murder. Authorities persisted with the alcohol poisoning narrative until the video emerged in November of 2022. Even with that new evidence, both countries' officials have stated that they will not pursue any legal proceedings. As of the latest updates on the case, number 22, Jose Gutierrez. On January 24th of 2023, Mexican authorities confirmed that they had found the body of missing American architect Jose Gutierrez, along with three others, in the charred remains of a van that was punched through with several bullet holes. Gutierrez had been visiting his fiance, Daniela Pichado. The pair made their way out to a bar in the town of Jerez de Garcia, Zacatecas, at some point, along with Pachado's sister, Viviana Marquez, and cousin, Irma Vargas. Events in the interim are unclear, but the four were killed, and that bullet-riddled van became their final resting place. Authorities on both sides of the border began investigating after Gutierrez's family back in Cincinnati, Ohio, filed a missing person report. Many locals in Jerez 
de Garcia reported hearing screaming while they were leaving the bar but chose not to investigate or bring the sound to the attention of local authorities. The entire state of Zacatecas is known to be rife with gang violence and other crime, being controlled in part by the infamous Sinaloa cartel. The reports of violence and chaos are so common in the area that the US government, among others, has warned travelers against going to Zacatecas for any reason. There have been no reported breaks in the case as of this writing, nor have there been any official comments. The radio silence from authorities, including locals and even the FBI, says it all. This tragedy was just another in a long line of violent killings to darken the Zacatecas area and will not be the last. Number 21. Kailani Boo and Angeli Riot Two eerily similar killings happened two years apart and saw two Instagram influencers, Kailani Boo and Angeli Riot, shot down in the prime of their lives by gangs with cartel ties. The two killings occurred in bars that were located near tourist hotspots. Even the two women's follow accounts were similar at the time of the murders, with Kailani Boo pushing 60,000 on her home platform and more than double that on Facebook, and Angeli Riot floating near the 45,000 mark on Instagram. That, though, is where the similarities largely end. Kailani Boo met her end sometime in July of 2019, and it took Mexican authorities until August to release details on the murder. The influencer was known for pushing for street cred alongside traditional Instagram clout and had even posed with guns on at least two occasions. She was rumored to have ties to local cartel La Union Tepito, and authorities say that members of this very cartel are the ones who killed her at a bar near Mexico City. Beyond that, no details have come to light at this time and no arrests have taken place. While Kailani Boo was taken down by the very cartel she apparently belonged to, Angeli Riot was by all reports an innocent bystander. She was killed at a bar in Tulum, close to Cancun. Members of the vicious and powerful Jalisco New Generation cartel were fighting members of the smaller Gulf cartel in October of 2021 and reached a point in the battle where one party decided to retreat. A lone motorcyclist trying to shake the pursuing gunners ducked into the bar where Riot was in an attempt at hiding, and the fight continued. One other tourist was reportedly struck down in the gunfire, and multiple bystanders were injured. As of this writing, authorities have yet to make any arrests or any official announcements beyond their initial statement. Number 20. Melissa Silva A team of gunmen in Mexican military uniforms reportedly from the Los Carrera cartel burst into a crowded cockfighting ring and opened fire, killing 20 people including 36-year-old Melissa Silva. The woman was on vacation to visit family in Michoacan, Mexico with her 16-year-old sister Arleth Silva. The younger sister survived the massacre but was hit three times and severely wounded when the smoke cleared. Authorities found over 100 assault rifle bullet shells littering the ground. The shooting happened in March of 2022. According to local authorities' investigation, the shooting was an attempt by the cartel to eliminate a rival kingpin that was supposed to be in attendance with links to the Jalisco New Generation cartel. Members of the Mexican military and National Guard were deployed to apprehend the gangsters. In the wake of the tragedy, the Silver family was left scrambling to pay for Arleth's care and to get her back home to Illinois. The family even resorted to creating a GoFundMe financially overburdened by the costs to take care of Arleth and the costs of Melissa's funeral. In a chilling coincidence, Melissa had shared a post online back in October of 2020 in mourning of an unspecified loved one. The post read, You left us at the moment we loved you the most, a sorrowful foreshadowing of what would happen to her less than two years later. Number 19. Ronita Miller 
a brutal cartel attack on a harmless wedding procession traveling through the Sierra Madre Mountains in November of 2019 left nine dead and the father of one of the victims who lost his daughter and four of his seven grandchildren calling for a Wild West-style response to gang violence in the country. 30-year-old Ronita Miller died in the attack along with four of her children aged between 10 years and eight months. The mother and two older children were reportedly robbed, then shot at point-blank range while the mum was dealing with a flat tire. The eight-month-old twins in the back of the SUV were burned alive when a hail of gunfire hit the vehicle, igniting the gas tank. Two other vehicles they were traveling with, whose drivers had stopped to aid Miller, were left in similar shape. Children who were lucky enough to survive either fled to get help or were found not long after when Miller's father, 59-year-old Adrian LeBaron arrived on the scene. The man took great pains to collect and preserve evidence at the scene after getting there long before authorities then turned over his findings to the FBI. Mexican authorities claimed that the attack was a case of mistaken identity. They believed that the cartel members had mistaken the procession of SUVs for a rival gang. LeBaron, on the other hand, believes that his family is one among many Mormon families targeted due to their refusal to allow the cartels to work freely in their hometowns. He went on to say that the Mexican government's response to ongoing gang violence has been wholly inadequate and in the area where the attack took place there are only scattered police forces belonging to local towns. According to him, a more centralized and direct application of manpower and firepower would be needed and he called for locals to rise up and take arms against the cartels that continue to brutalize the populace. In essence, the grieving man called for nothing short of all-out war against the vicious gangs. As of the latest updates on this particular case, authorities have yet to find those responsible or even determine what particular cartel they were tied to. Number 18. Heathco and Lutz On June the 14th of 2023, two American tourists, 41-year-old John Heathco and 28-year-old Abby Lutz, were found dead in their luxury hotel suite in Baja, California. According to local authorities, the cause of death was intoxication by some unknown substance. This was changed from an earlier prognosis, an equally vague statement, that the pair had been done in by the inhalation of an unknown gas. The two victims bore no marks of violence on their bodies and their room showed no sign of struggle. When authorities discovered the pair around 9 p.m., they were estimated to have died some 10 hours before. The investigation into the matter is ongoing but one of the most likely culprits is carbon monoxide poisoning. This reportedly happens with some regularity in Mexican lodgings, even among luxury hotel brands. In this case, the site of the tragedy was the Hotel Rancho Pescadero, a Hyatt property, where rooms can reportedly cost $500 per night. As of this writing, the company has not yet commented on the case. Number 17. Carla Pardini Mexican TikTok influencer Carla Pardini answered a phone call on September the 20th of 2022 and when she stepped outside as the caller had requested, she was met by a hail of bullets. The 21-year-old was killed just outside her home in the affluent city of Culachan, the capital of Sinaloa, Mexico. The call came in at about 10.30 p.m. according to the victim's mother. The odd hours and mysterious request weren't enough to dissuade the Web 2.0 star, suggesting she may have known the caller. She ultimately walked out to the intersection of nearby streets Catedraticos and Ignacio Lopez Reon, and the neighborhood became her final resting place. Authorities have yet to make any arrests as of the latest available updates. There had apparently been scattered reports of unknown individuals walking the surrounding area in the days leading up to the murder, armed to the teeth. Authorities have tentatively slapped the generic label of femicide on the crime, a sadly common phenomenon 
in gang-controlled areas of Mexico. Circumstances suggest, however, that Pardini was targeted. The influence's main areas of expertise were fashion and dancing, two areas where it would be quite difficult to make enemies. One of her last posts before her death seems to loosely support the sentiment that somebody may have had her in their sights. The caption reading, I hope you don't like me. Number 16. Candace Florence On October 30th, 2022, Candace Florence contacted her boyfriend in Virginia Beach at around 2 a.m. from an Airbnb in Mexico City before she and the two friends staying with her died. The trio were found by authorities the next day. Along with 28-year-old Florence, the victims included her high school friend, 28-year-old Jordan Marshall, and his friend, Cortez Hall. The trio were visiting Mexico to celebrate Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Authorities were alerted by a call from the security guards at the upscale apartment community where the tragedy took place. They had detected what they described as a strong smell that could indicate a gas leak. By the time authorities found the source of the smell, the three tourists were already dead inside the apartment. The official ruling was that the leak happened because of a gas boiler that was aging and not properly maintained. In the wake of the incident, Florence's boyfriend, 30-year-old Victor Day, lamented the fact that he could have helped. According to Day, Florence had video called him on FaceTime and he witnessed her vomiting violently. She complained of feeling tired, ill, and in pain. She suspected she may have been drugged. Day, concurring with her sentiment, advised her to sleep it off. He expressed regret that he didn't know what was truly going on and should have called authorities immediately or at least advised his girlfriend to leave. Florence left behind a candle business in Virginia Beach, which her family will run for the time being. As of the latest updates, no arrests have been made, nor have any civil charges been filed. Number 15. Tatiana Mirutenko In July of 2017, Tatiana Murutenko went to Acapulco with her husband to celebrate their first wedding anniversary and was gunned down outside a bar. She had gone into the upscale establishment, expecting the same joyous experience she had on numerous vacations to Mexico since childhood. That was how things played out until she left the bar. Two speeding motorcycles zoomed by the bar, their riders firing guns at unknown targets. One of the bullets struck 27-year-old Muratenko and she died instantly. Speaking to a news outlet, her father tearfully reported that her killers were never found. Muratenko was merely one of over 15,000 homicides reported in Mexico that year. Of those, 953 happened in Acapulco, a popular tourist destination. Officials downplayed the severity of the violence, claiming that the vast majority of Mexico's 35 million annual tourists have a great time and make it home safe. Despite that claim, many parts of Mexico currently carry a level four do not travel advisory from the United States government. Number 14, Abby Connor. 20-year-old Abby Connor found out the hard way that there's a big difference between top-shelf tequila and the stuff served at dive bars when she blacked out, fell into a pool, and drowned. While on vacation in Cancun, Mexico, she had been drinking at a poolside bar at her resort in Pariso del Mar, where the drinks came for free. With her all-inclusive vacation package, it's not uncommon for name brand alcohol to populate the shelves at these resorts, but the batch that Abby drank apparently had something else in it to make it hit a bit harder. Wandering the grounds of the hotel while completely drunk, she got a bit too close to a shallow pool at the resort, fell in and drowned. With no lifeguards nearby, another guest informed hotel staff about the incident. Abby was found with her brother, Austin Connor, who had also consumed the alcohol in question. The two were taken to a nearby hospital without a word to their parents who were staying with them at the resort. Austin was rescued in time and managed to recover quickly. In Abby's case, however, the hospital demanded a large sum up front 
Before she would be transferred to the intensive care unit, she ended up being airlifted to a Florida hospital where she was officially declared brain dead. Mere days later, the once vibrant young woman could not hold on any longer and died in January of 2018. A civil suit for wrongful death filed later by her family alleged that Iberostar, the company behind the resort hotel as well as many of its partners, knew that alcohol served there was not as it should be. According to the suit, the resort knowingly served drinks that were tainted, substandard, poisonous, unfit for human consumption. A raid by authorities back in 2017 recovered batches of illicit booze from the same resort, which turned up dangerous levels of methanol. A special investigation by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel turned up over 100 reports of vacationers in Mexico passing out from relatively small amounts of drink, after which they were often robbed or even lasciviously assaulted. Information on the outcome of that case and any relevant official investigation was unfortunately not available as of the latest updates. Number 13. Alejandra Villanueva Ibarra On January the 16th of 2017, the popular BPM Electronic Music Festival in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, claimed the lives of five people when a shooting broke out, one of whom was 18-year-old Alejandra Villanueva Ibarra, who was trampled in a rush to escape. Ignacio Valencia, a man she met at the festival and became fast friends with, witnessed the carnage and later spoke out. According to him, the shooting erupted from nowhere. Nobody could pin down where the shots were coming from or who was letting them off. Because of this, the thousands-strong crowd began a mad scramble for the exit. He was alongside Ibarra while the teen tried to escape and watched the panicked throngs stomp the life out of her. Alejandra, a native of Denver, Colorado, left behind two siblings and a sickly mother. The family depended on her income, prompting her brother to set up a GoFundMe page after her death. The page was set up with a $10,000 goal to help get the girl's body home for a proper funeral and to help the family cope with the financial loss and subsequent transition of no longer having her income to fall back on. The page has exceeded that goal by about $5,000 as of this writing. Whether they got her body back as well as what actions authorities may have taken is unclear. According to the latest available updates, the Mexican consulate was not being helpful with the family's plight. Number 12. Chiara Agnew In March of 2023, a dream trip to Playa del Carmen for 23-year-old Chiara Agnew became a nightmare when she wound up dead and her boyfriend, Ryan Fryson, was detained in connection with her death. Details in this case are sparse, but the Canadian woman was found dead in her room with her boyfriend nearby, who was a player in the Dawson Creek Canucks hockey team. Her body bore marks which indicated that a violent struggle had taken place before she died. Authorities did not name the person they detained, but did mention that he was a foreign national. Additionally, Fryson did not come home. The obvious assumption here is that Fryson may be the culprit, but there is no further word from officials as of the latest updates. The two families who lost members have reportedly been in contact and nothing has come up that would implicate Fryson Given the proliferation of gang violence and other crimes in the area the tragedy took place at, the lack of publicly available information leaves considerable doubt that Fryson actually killed his girlfriend, despite circumstantial evidence pointing to him. Number 11. Elliot Blair In January of 2023, 33-year-old Elliot Blair took his wife to a Baja California resort that the pair frequented and ended up being found dead on the pavement outside his room in the wee hours of the morning. Kim Blair spoke to journalists about the lead-up to her husband's death, painting a vivid picture of an otherwise normal day of revelry that ended in tragedy. The couple were in town to mark the first anniversary of their wedding and had been 
to the Las Rocas Resort many times before, leaving her questioning why this visit ended so differently. According to the distraught wife, she and her husband had begun the day with a visit to the resort's pool, where they met another couple and exchanged numbers. The two later had some drinks and went dancing in another resort facility. Around 7 p.m., all seemed well around midnight, when the two retired to their room after enjoying karaoke with a local singer that they knew. Kim went immediately to bed while Elliot decided to take a shower. After that, she was awakened by hotel staff who asked her to identify a dead man one story down from her room and about four feet away. Kim said that Elliot's body lacked any puddles or trails of blood, any strange marks or any other indications that he had jumped from the balcony, which was the story hotel staff and officials leaned on at first. At some point, Kim was told that her husband sported a bullet wound. The bizarre change of stories as well as how quickly their day reached a freakish and tragic conclusion left Kim and the rest of the lawyer's family scrambling for answers. The widow was cleared to leave the country and return to the States without any answers as of the latest updates. Officials stated that Elliot had a high blood alcohol level at the time of his death and are ruling it an accident. Number 10. Woodard and Brown Two Americans found dead in Mexico were identified and were found to be two or four individuals taken at gunpoint by cartel members during a shootout in the city of Matamoros. Shahid Woodard and Zindel Brown had gone with Latavia McGee and Eric Williams, crossing the border for McGee to receive cosmetic surgery. The four had only recently gotten into Mexico when gunfire erupted around them. They had stumbled into a war between drug cartels and the gangsters paused their battle to set their sights on the foreigners. The four were found in a shack east of the city under guard. Authorities detained the man guarding them but have yet to name him or give word on any collaborators. The two survivors initially went to a nearby hospital but were later taken back to the United States to receive further care. Reports did not specify whom but one of the two was apparently shot. While Mexican authorities did manage to make one arrest in connection with the case, details on what may have happened and who was involved have not surfaced. Local police stated that they wanted to perform an examination on the corpses of Woodard and Brown and would send the corpses back to the United States. Despite this, further details were unavailable as of the latest updates. Number 9. Maria Fernandez Martinez Jimenez In January of 2023, 26-year-old mum Maria Fernandez Martinez Jimenez lost her life to a shark attack at Malaque Beach in Jalisco, Mexico, but managed to ensure the safety of her five-year-old daughter. The beast struck when she was roughly 65 feet out from shore. Jimenez saw the danger come in and prioritized her daughter's safety, lifting the girl onto a floating toy and setting her on her way toward the shore. The shark set upon her with terrifying force before she could get herself and her daughter out of the water, tearing her leg off. Onlookers alerted a lifeguard when Jimenez seemed to be having trouble staying above water and rescue efforts began. She was brought up onto the sand, missing a leg along with her little girl. The child was unharmed, but Jimenez suffered such a severe injury that she bled out completely and passed long before first responders even arrived. In response, local authorities called off an aquatic race that was supposed to happen that day and temporarily barred access to the beach. Number 8. Juan Hernandez In July of 2015, Juan Hernandez and his family traveled to Cancun from San Antonio. Three days into the vacation, they were visiting the Mayan ruins at Tulum. While there, Hernandez told his wife Karina that he suspected something had bitten him. His leg hurt and felt like it was burning. Hernandez would later learn that he'd been bitten by a pit viper, a venomous snake species found throughout the Americas. He hadn't felt the attack because the reptile had sunk its fangs in an area of his leg where he had no feeling due to a previous skin graft. Within a few hours, Hernandez was in excruciating pain, and as his condition worsened, black and purple spots started to appear on his body. 
Hernandez and his wife went to four different hospitals searching for one equipped with anti-venom. He waited in agony for the life-saving medicine to arrive. By the time it was administered, it was too late. Hernandez bled out roughly 30 hours after the bite. In the aftermath, his wife was critical of the country's medical system, which she felt had failed her husband. Number 7. Pat Landers and Carla Bassa In the spring of 2020, during the early stages of the pandemic, 32-year-old Pat Landers and his girlfriend, Carla Bassa, were gunned down while quarantining in Juarez, Mexico. The couple had met in Texas and had been dating for a few months when travel restrictions prevented Landers from returning to upstate New York. Bassa, a citizen of New Mexico, had spent several months outside the country and had recently been cleared to start teaching at a primary school in Juarez. The couple had exited a cell phone store and were driving along the street in a black 2019 Jeep Sahara, which featured New York license plates. In broad daylight, a hail of at least 20 bullets was fired upon Landers and Bassa. Both were killed as the shots shattered the vehicle's windshield. Over a year since the incident, no discernible motive has been found and none of the gunmen have been arrested. Local police believe that the couple had been collateral victims, caught in ongoing gangland warfare over control of the drug trade. Since the stay-at-home order issued in on March the 23rd and up until the murder of Landers and Bassa, over 100 killings had been reported in Juarez, according to the KTSM news outlet. Number 6. Giovanni Ramirez In early May of 2020, Giovanni Lopez Ramirez, a bricklayer from Ixlahuacan de los Membrilos, died following excessive force exercised by local authorities. Lopez's brother, Christian, pulled his phone out and captured the moment that the police picked him up from the family home for allegedly not wearing a mask. In the 96-second video, one officer shouted at Christian to stop filming while two others violently restrained his brother in the background. Giovanni was shoved into the rear seat of a squad pickup truck. His family called the mayor, who told them that they could pick Giovanni up from the municipal jail the following morning. However, when they arrived, they were informed that he was at the civil hospital of Guadalajara. The family had been told he'd been taken to the hospital because the officers went heavy-handed. Upon arriving to the medical facility, they found that the 30-year-old had passed away from a traumatic brain injury while the rest of his body featured lesions as well as a gunshot injury to the left ankle. Christian released a video of the arrest about a month later. He claimed that Ixlahuacan's mayor, Eduardo Cervantes Aguirre, had offered him over $9,000 but also threatened to kill his family if he made it public. Within a few days, hundreds of young people protested police brutality in downtown Guadalajara. They painted graffiti, broke windows and set two squad cars ablaze to which the authorities responded with tear gas and other riot control measures. Mexican actress Salma Hayek and director Guillermo del Toro condemned the killing of Giovanni on social media. As more protests broke out in other areas of Mexico, three officers were arrested on June the 5th of 2020. Number 5. Andrew Dales In 2009, a young American tourist was savaged by a crocodile while visiting Cancun. 20-year-old Andrew Dales, originally from Dallas, had gone to relieve himself at the edge of the local Nikupte Lagoon. The area, like other lagoons in Cancun, featured signs warning tourists about crocodiles. While less aggressive than other species, Crocodilus acutus, commonly known as the American crocodile, can grow up to 20 feet and weigh 2,000 pounds. In spite of the warnings, Dales approached the water. A crocodile suddenly snapped at him inflicting multiple bite wounds to his leg and neck. Dales also suffered wounds to his head after the crocodile knocked him to the ground. Fortunately, the reptile relinquished its attack and Dales recovered from his injuries. Number 4. Arline Martinez In early October of 2020, a young woman from Chihuahua was accidentally shot dead while filming a fake abduction video for TikTok. 20-year-old Arline Martinez had previously uploaded similar clips to the social media app, which featured her bound, blindfolded and held at gunpoint. Ten or more people were reportedly present as the staged kidnapping was being filmed in the neighborhood of Rigoberto Quiroz. Martinez and a second fake hostage were struggling while several men role-playing as their captors were pointing firearms and pretending to attack them. A 45 caliber handgun then went off and Martinez, a mother of one, was fatally shot in the head. The police were called and 
Most of those present fled the scene, including two men in a Jeep Cherokee, one of whom was suspected to have shot Martinez. The state's attorney general theorized that the shooter had no idea the gun was loaded, but emphasized that the legal course would be followed, including identifying those responsible and determining the origin of the gun. Number 3. 1985 Museum of Anthropology Heist One of the biggest art heists in history took place in 1985 at Mexico City's Museum of Anthropology and History. It occurred in the early hours of Christmas Day and the thieves took advantage of the guards being distracted. Against surveillance protocol, they were all in a single area of the museum drinking and celebrating Christmas Eve. The thieves jumped over the fence and entered the building's Mayan Hall through an air-conditioning vent. They emptied out several display cases and targeted the most valuable pieces. The thieves made off with 124 small Mayan, Aztec, Miztec and Zapotec artifacts, some worth millions of dollars. The heist made national and international news and a number of theories emerged in the aftermath, proposing a larger conspiracy. Some suggested that the theft had been orchestrated by the CIA or the KGB to circumvent a Mexican law that prevented the sale of pre-Columbian artifacts to private collections. For years, the investigation saw little progress, partly due to the fact that the authorities were looking for professionals. The heist had actually been perpetrated by amateurs, Carlos Perches Trevino and Ramon Sardina Garcia, two veterinary students in their 20s. In the months leading up to the heist, they'd visited the museum over 50 times. They took photos, made sketches, studied surveillance patterns and inquired about which pieces were most valuable. After the heist, Purchase and Sardina fled to Acapulco. An attempt to negotiate the sale of the artifacts with a middleman would ultimately lead to their arrest in June of 1989. In spite of fears that they'd been smuggled out of the country, the vast majority of archaeological pieces were recovered. Today's topic was requested by Stephanie Durate, 3848, Massa Moon Streams and Rufus Robinson, 3348. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Andres Mendoza In May of 2021, a man suspected of being a serial killer as well as a cannibal was arrested in Atizapan de Zaragoza following the disappearance of 34-year-old Reina Gonzalez. The woman, wife to a local police officer, had gone to meet 72-year-old Andres Mendoza. He was a family acquaintance from whom Gonzalez had agreed to purchase cell phone parts for her business. When she didn't return, her husband went to Mendoza's residence, a slum dwelling on the outskirts of the municipality, but wasn't allowed inside. He returned with more officers and a series of gruesome discoveries was made after they found Gonzalez's hacked body on a table inside. Mendoza would later claim, I removed the skin from her face because she was very pretty. Following his arrest, the former butcher would callously admit to killing several more women since 2001, as well as eating parts of their bodies. He'd meet them at local bars and murder them once they refused his romantic advances. After using power tools to smash through the concrete floors, the police found the remains of at least nine other potential victims. Some of their personal belongings, video recordings of them dying, but also a notebook with the names of 29 women. Even though he'd confessed to murdering and dismembering six women, the police suspect that Mendoza might actually be among Mexico's most prolific serial killers. His trial and the investigation are ongoing. Stick around after number one if you'd also like to watch our episode on when the United Kingdom goes wrong. Number one, Juana Barraza. Juana Barraza, known as La Mata Vajitas, or Old Lady Killer, was arrested in 2006 for a series of murders spanning eight years. Barraza had grown up with an alcoholic mother. She reportedly traded Barraza for three beers to a man who abused her and by whom she became pregnant with a son. Later in life, Barraza developed a strong interest in Luca Libre, Mexico's variant of professional wrestling, fighting under the name Lady of Silence. Her activity as a serial killer began in the late 1990s. By Barraza's own admission, the trauma of her upbringing influenced her victim selection, all of whom were women aged 60 or over. She gained their trust, often posing as a government official offering welfare programs. The women were then strangled or bludgeoned to death before being robbed. 
As late as the summer of 2005, the authorities dismissed reports of a serial killer as sensationalism, an aspect for which they'd subsequently be heavily criticized by the media. By late fall, the police recognized they were dealing with a killer whom they suspected was actually a man disguised in women's clothes. In January of 2006, the police arrested Barraza in a borough of Mexico City as she was fleeing the home of her latest victim, an 84-year-old woman whom she'd strangled with a stethoscope. Baratza closely resembled a composite model of the killer's features and fingerprint evidence linked her to another 10 killings of a suspected 49 in total. On March the 31st of 2008, she was found guilty on 16 charges of murder and aggravated burglary, including 11 separate counts of murder. She was sentenced to 759 years in prison. Number 8. Mark Dixie In the mid-2000s, London teenager Sally Ann Bowman was in the early stage of a promising modeling career. Others in the industry had compared her to supermodel Kate Moss, and in January of 2005, she joined Pulse Model Management, subsequently becoming the face of Swatch Watches. On September the 24th of that year, she went out with a group of friends to Lloyd's Bar in Croydon. In the early hours of the following day, the 18-year-old called her ex-boyfriend to pick her up after her older sister had reportedly been arrested for fighting. Bowman and her ex had a heated argument inside the car and at around 4 a.m. she got out near her Blenheim Crescent residence while the man drove off. Within minutes, Bowman was brutally stabbed in the neck and stomach. The teenager was then assaulted as she was either dead or dying before the killer made off with her cardigan, underwear, handbag, and cell phone. The ex-boyfriend was taken into custody as the primary suspect before he was eventually ruled out based on DNA evidence. In June of 2006, the police arrested Croydon man Mark Dixie, whom it later emerged was a registered offender. The 35-year-old had provided the authorities with a DNA sample after he'd been arrested following a pub brawl a few weeks earlier. The sample definitively tied him to Bowman. He only admitted to the assault, claiming he'd found her on the ground and didn't know she'd been stabbed. It only took a jury three hours to convict him on the charge of murder. On February the 22nd of 2008, he was sentenced to life with a mandatory 34 years, one of the longest minimum terms ever imposed upon a single murderer in the UK. Number 7. Russell Marsh After months of being unhappy in her marriage, Jade Ward asked her husband Russell Marsh to leave their North Wales home in August of 2021. There had been periods of separation followed by reconciliation in their relationship in the past. Some of the rifts were reportedly fueled by Marsh's controlling and paranoid behavior. But 27-year-old Ward was reportedly determined to end the marriage for good and move on with her life. On August the 26th, as their four children slept, Marsh entered the Shotton home using the key he still had in his possession in what would later be described as a brutal and remarkably cruel murder. He disfigured Ward with a knife and then fatally strangled her. In the immediate aftermath, he drove the children to his parents' house in Colchester before surrendering to the police. They found the woman's body dumped under a pile of clothes in a room that had been sealed with a dressing gown cord. 29-year-old Marsh would maintain that her injuries and death had been the result of a sadomasochistic game gone wrong. He claimed that Ward had asked that he strangle her while they were having consensual relations, before later stating that she'd cut up her face and taunted him. His version of events was dismissed as falsehoods and slurs by the judge presiding over his case. Marsh was found guilty of murder and sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison. Number 6. Abby Watson in February of 2018, Welsh woman Abby Watson and her boyfriend were at a pub in Newport, where the former was involved in a brutal altercation with another woman. Watson's boyfriend had lost his wallet and the couple asked 26-year-old trainee beautician Demi Marshall if she'd seen it. The innocuous question enraged the woman who started screaming at Watson. When the latter went to confront her, Marshall smashed a wine glass on the bar and in a split second forcefully pushed it into Watson's face before dragging it across her cheek. The victim began bleeding profusely and passed out, causing her boyfriend to fear for her life. While she waited for an ambulance, others in the pub started wrapping coats around her, as due to the shock, she'd begun shaking uncontrollably. Watson received two blood transfusions and at least 
65 stitches during an operation to mend her severe face wounds. She had also suffered an eye injury and a fractured cheekbone in the attack. The 22-year-old experienced extensive mental anguish during her recovery after being left with large scars on her face. The woman reportedly felt like her life is over, started taking antidepressants, suffered from nightmares, and took down the mirrors in her house so as to avoid reliving her ordeal. Marshall was subsequently found guilty of wounding with intent to inflict grievous bodily harm and sentenced to six years in prison. Number 5. Nicholas Foy after consuming a life-threatening amount of alcohol and cocaine, an Englishman stabbed a French tourist to death in Eltham, southeast London, on August 11th of 2017. Accomplished triathlete Laurent Volpe, aged 49, was on a two-week holiday with his wife and two children. He stepped outside to get some food when Nicholas Foy, a man in his late 30s, started following him. Foy, who was only wearing a pair of pink shorts at the time, plunged a large kitchen knife into Volpe's stomach in a random and unprovoked attack. The blade punctured the Frenchman's liver. He was taken to King's College Hospital where he passed away three days later in spite of having received a liver transplant. In the immediate aftermath, Foy shouted at witnesses, do you want some? Before he was captured by CCTV, fleeing the scene of the stabbing. He was approached by law enforcement shortly thereafter and punched an officer before he was subdued with a taser. He was taken to a hospital for self-inflicted injuries to his foot, which he'd gouged with the knife believing there was a bomb inside. While at the medical facility, Foy headbutted another officer before he was sedated by staff. During the trial that followed, he blamed his behavior on the drugs and alcohol binge, but was ultimately ordered to serve a minimum of 17 years in prison. Number 4. Graham Williamson in August of 2020, Scottish man Graham Kermit Williamson was gunned down in the garden of his property in Blantyre, South Lanarkshire, in what was deemed as retaliation for a humiliating video. A few days prior to the shooting on August the 14th, convicted drug dealer Hardman Felvis had been confronted by Williamson and his friends at the Shanghai Tea House in nearby Bothwell. He was filmed hiding under tables and calling the police. The clip was distributed on Instagram and 25-year-old Felvis would later admit in court he'd felt embarrassed as it damaged his street reputation. A short while after the confrontation, Williamson's car was set on fire. Felvis teamed up with fellow reputed drug traffickers Thomas Durris and James Bailey, both in their late 20s. The trio rented a flat in Edinburgh as a meeting point, traveled to Glasgow where they purchased balaclavas and then used a stolen car with fake plates to approach Williamson's Blantyre residence on August the 17th. Durris allegedly acted as the trigger man. CCTV footage captured him approaching Williamson from behind and shooting him in the back with a sawed-off shotgun. He then got into the getaway car driven by Bailey and upon reaching Edinburgh, the three men reportedly boasted about the killing. All of their actions were subsequently retraced by law enforcement. The three men were arrested, found guilty of murder, and sentenced to life in prison, with minimum sentences of 23 years for Felvis and Durris, as well as 21 years for Bailey. Number 3. Lewis Ashdown 19-year-old Lewis Ashdown and Mark Williams, aged 18, met up online in late 2020 and developed a friendship that resulted in them spending time together in Uckfield, East Sussex, where they both lived. On May the 29th of 2021, Ashdown asked the other teenager to meet him in Fair Warp Field. Once they were both there, he encouraged him to drink copious amounts of soda that had been mixed with whiskey. Williams became intoxicated to the point that he could no longer move properly. About half an hour before midnight, he called his aunt to say that he was heading home. Ashdown was reportedly overheard in the background saying, Don't worry, I'll make sure he gets home okay. In the minutes that followed, he knifed Williams in the back. Ashdown continued stabbing him throughout the body and head, ultimately inflicting 107 puncture wounds. He gouged Williams' eyes out, mutilated his groin region, and repeatedly kicked him in the head. He then dumped his mangled body in a stream, and Williams was subsequently reported missing. Ashdown behaved normally the following day when he went to the cinema and watched a horror film, The Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It, with friend Liam Hansen. Eventually, he and the latter got drunk on Jack Daniels and Ashdown confessed that he'd killed Williams because he'd been annoying him. He showed Hansen several horrific cell phone clips of what he'd done to the victim, maintaining that he'd deserved to die. Ashdown was subsequently arrested and after pleading guilty to murder, 
sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 27 years served. Number 2. Derek Bird On June the 2nd of 2010, over a 15-mile stretch of coastline in Cumbria, England, taxi driver Derek Bird carried out one of the deadliest mass shootings in UK history. There was a combination of factors that had led to the 52-year-old's mental breakdown and ensuing killing spree. A Thai woman whom he'd met on holiday to Pattaya had ended their relationship via text message after he'd sent her over $1,000. He bore a grudge against his Sellafield nuclear power plant, from which he'd been terminated amidst allegations of theft. He was investigated for tax evasion and also involved in a will dispute with his twin brother, David, who would become Bird's first victim. The man traveled to his brother's home and shot him 11 times in the head and body with a 22 caliber rifle. He then killed the family solicitor, Kevin Commons, whom he'd also held responsible for the ongoing legal dispute. Bird gunned him down with a sawed-off shotgun and then a rifle at his Frizzington residence. He then shot at several fellow taxi drivers, killing one and severely injuring another and his passenger. Bird's spree continued through several neighboring towns and partially unfolded with him calling random people to his taxi and then firing at them, alternating between his shotgun and rifle. As he drove towards sea scale, he reduced his speed and shot at other motorists. In the afternoon near the village of Boot, Bird crashed his taxi into a stone wall, damaging one of its tires and then continuing on foot. At around 2 p.m., the authorities announced that they'd found his body in a woodland area, where he'd taken his own life. Throughout his rampage, Bird had claimed the lives of 12 people and injured 11 others. Number 1. Robert Maudsley Robert Maudsley, one of the UK's most terrifying serial killers, was active in the 1970s and mainly targeted people who preyed on children. In 1974, when he was in his early 20s, Maudsley was working as a male escort in London to support his drug habit. He was picked up by a man named John Farrell in Wood Green, who proceeded to show him pictures of the children he'd assaulted. Maudsley, himself a victim of childhood abuse, killed Farrell by garroting, stabbing, and smashing him over the head with a hammer. After surrendering to the police and being found unfit to stand trial, he was sent to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. It was there that in 1977, he and another resident, David Cheeseman, locked themselves in a room on their ward with convicted predator David Francis. They tortured the man for nine hours, forcing others to hear his agonizing screams as they flayed him alive and cracked his skull open. The murderous pair then held his body aloft for the guards to see. A member of the security personnel would report that there was a plastic spoon sticking out of Francis's head. It led to rumors that Maudsley had eaten part of his brain, and he was henceforth known in the press as Hannibal the Cannibal or the Brain Eater. An autopsy confirmed that he'd never cannibalized the victim but had turned the spoon into a weapon which he'd used to stab him in the brain through the ear. Maudsley was transferred to Wakefield Prison with the recommendation he never be released. The following year, he killed two inmates in one day. He lured Salni Darwood, a man convicted of assault and the murder of his wife, to his cell, where he carotted and fatally stabbed him with an improvised dagger. After hiding a body under his bed, Maudsley prowled the wing and cornered convicted molester William Roberts in his cell. He hacked his skull open before repeatedly slamming his head against the wall. Maudsley then calmly surrendered the dagger to prison officials, claiming they'd be two inmates short for the next roll call. Maudsley was permanently placed in an underground bulletproof perspex box and as of 2022, updates had vowed to kill again if ever released. Thanks for watching. Would you rather live in the UK or the US? Let us know in the comments section below.